Metamorphoses by Ovid, Book the First, The Creation of the World. Of bodies changed to various forms I sing, ye gods from whom these miracles did spring, inspire my numbers with celestial heat, to I my long laborious work complete, and add a perpetual tenor to my rhymes, deduced from nature's birth to Caesar's times. Before the seas in this terrestrial bowl and heaven's high canopy that covers all, one was the face of nature, if a face, rather a rude and indigested mass, a lifeless lump unfashioned and unframed, of jarring seeds and justly chaos named. No sun was lighted up, the world to view. No moon did yet her blunted horns renew. Nor was earth suspended in the sky, nor poised did on her own foundations lie. Nor seas about the shores their arms had thrown, but earth and air and water were in one. Thus air was void of light, and earth unstable, and water's dark abyss unnavigable. No certain form on any was impressed. All were confused, and each disturbed the rest, for hot and cold were in one body fixed and soft with hard and light with heavy mixed. But God or nature, while they thus contend, to these intestine discords put an end. Then earth from air and seas from earth were driven, and grosser air sunk from ethereal heaven. Thus disembroiled, they take their proper place, the next of kin contiguously embrace, and foes are sundered by a larger space, and force of fire ascended first on high, and took its dwelling in the vaulted sky. Then air succeeds in lightness next to fire, whose atoms from unactive earth retire. Earth sinks beneath and draws a numerous throng of ponderous, thick, unwieldy seeds along. About her coast unruly waters roar, and rising on a ridge insult the shore. Thus, when the god, whatever god was he, had formed the whole and made the parts agree, that no unequal portions might be found. He molded earth into a spacious round, then with a breath he gave the winds to blow, and bade the congregated waters flow. He adds the running springs and standing lakes and bounding banks for winding rivers make. Some part in earth are swallowed up. The most in ample oceans disembogued are lost. He shades the woods, the valleys he restrains with rocky mountains and extends the plains. And as five zones the ethereal regions bind, five correspond are to earth assigned. The sun with rays directly darting down, fires all beneath and fries the middle zone. The two beneath the distant poles complain of endless winter and perpetual rain. Betwixt the extremes two happier climates hold. The temper that partakes of hot and cold. The fields of liquid air enclosing all surround the compass of this earthly ball. The lighter parts lie next to the fires above. The grosser near the watery surface move. Thick clouds are spread, and storms engender there. And thunders voice with wretched mortals fear, and winds that on their wings cold winter bear. Nor were those blustering brethren left at large, on seas and shores their fury to discharge. Bound as they are and circumscribed in place, they rend the world resistless until they pass, and muddy marks of mischief leave behind, such as the rage of their tempestuous kind. First, Euros to the rising morn is sent, the regions of the balmy continent, and eastern realms where early Persians run, to greet the blessed appearance of the sun. Westward, the wanton zephyr wings his flight. Pleased with the remnants of departing light, fierce Boreas with his offspring issues forth to invade the frozen wagon of the north. While frowning Auster seeks the southern sphere and rots with endless rain the unwholesome year. Higher o'er the clouds and empty realms of wind, the god a clearer space for heaven designed, where fields of light and liquid ether flow, purged from the ponderous dregs of earth below. 
Scarce had the power distinguished these, when straight the stars, no longer overlaid with weight, exert their heads from underneath the mass, and upward shoot and kindle as they pass, and with diffusive light adorn their heavenly place. Then every void of nature to supply, with forms of gods, he fills the vacant sky, new herds of beasts he sends, the plains to share, new colonies of birds to people air, and to their oozy beds the finny fish repair. A creature of a more exalted kind was wanting yet, and then was man designed, conscious of thought, of more capricious breast, for empire formed and fit to rule the rest. Whether with particles of heavenly fire, the god of nature did his soul inspire, or earth but new divided from the sky, and pliant still retained the ethereal energy, which wise Prometheus tempered into paste, and mixed with living streams the godlike image cast. Thus, while the mute creation downward bend their sight, and to their earthly mother tend, man looks aloft, and with erected eyes, beholds his own hereditary skies, from such rude principles our form began, and earth was metamorphosed into man. The Golden Age the golden age was first, when man yet knew, no rule but uncorrupted reason knew, and with a native bent did good pursue, unforced by punishment, unawed by fear. His words were simple and his soul sincere. Needless was written law, were none oppressed. The law of man was written in his breast. No suppliant crowds before the judge appeared, no court erected yet, nor cause was heard, but all was safe, for conscience was their guard. The mountain trees in distant prospect please, ere yet the pine descended to the seas, ere sails were spread, new oceans to explore, and happy mortals unconcerned for more, confined their wishes to their native shore. No walls were yet, nor fence, nor moat, nor mound, nor drum was heard, nor trumpet's angry sound. No swords were forged, but void of care and crime the soft creation, slept away their time. The teeming earth yet guiltless of the plough, and unprovoked did fruitful stores allow, content with food which nature freely bred, on wildings and on strawberry fields they fed, cornels and bramble berries gave the rest, and folly acorns furnished out a feast, and flowers unsown, in fields and meadows reigned, and western winds immortal spring maintained. In following years the bearded corn ensued, from earth unasked, nor was the earth renewed, from veins of valleys milk and nectar broke, and honey sweating through the pores of oak. The Silver Age. But when good Saturn, banished from above, was driven to hell, the world was under Jove. The succeeding times a silver age, behold, Excelling brass, but more excelled by gold. Then summer, autumn, winter did appear, And spring was but a season of the year. The sun his annual course obliquely made, Good days contracted, and enlarged the bad. Then air with sultry heats began to glow. The wings of winds were clogged with ice and snow. And shivering mortals in houses driven Sought shelter from the inclemency of heaven. Those houses then were caves or homely sheds, with twining osiers fenced and moss their beds. Then ploughs for seed the fruitful furrows broke, and oxen laboured first beneath the yoke. The brazen age to this next came in course. The brazen age, a warlike offspring, prompt to bloody rage, not impious yet. The iron age, Hard steel succeeded then, and stubborn as the metal were the men. Truth, modesty, and shame the world forsook. Fraud, avarice, and force their places took. Then sails were spread to every wind that blew. Raw were the sailors, and the depths were new. Trees rudely hollowed did the waves sustain. Ere ships in triumph ploughed the watery plain. Then landmarks limited to each his right, for all those before was common as the light. Nor was the ground alone acquired to bear her annual income to the crooked share. 
But greedy mortals rummaging her store digged from her entrails first the precious ore, which next to hell the prudent gods has laid, and that alluring ill to sight displayed. Thus cursed steel, and more cursed gold, gave mischief birth, and made that mischief bold, and double death did wretched man invade, by steel assaulted, and by gold betrayed. Now brandished weapons glittering in their hands, mankind is broken loose from moral bands, no rites of hospitality remain, the guest by him who harbored him is slain. The son-in-law pursues the father's life, the wife her husband murders, he the wife. The stepdame poison for the son prepares. The son inquires into his father's years. Faith flies and piety in exile mourns, and justice here oppressed to heaven returns. The Giants' Wars nor were the gods themselves more safe above. Against beleaguered heaven the giants move. Hills piled on hills, on mountains mountain lie. To make their mad approaches to the sky, till Jove, no longer patient, took his time to avenge with thunder their audacious crime. Red lightning played along the firmament, and their demolished works to pieces rent. Singed with the flames and with the bolts transfixed, with native earth, their blood, the monsters mixed. The blood, endued with animating heat, did in the impregnant earth new sons beget. They, like the seed from which they sprung, accursed, against the gods the immortal hatred nursed. An impious, arrogant, and cruel brood, expressing their original from blood. Which, when the kings of God beheld from high, withal revolving in his memory what he himself had found on earth of late, Lycon's guilt and in his inhuman treat, he sighed, no longer with his pity strove, but kindled to a wrath, becoming Jove. Then called a general council of the gods, who summoned issued from their blessed abodes and filled the assembly with a shining train. Away there is, is heaven's expanded plain, which, when the skies are clear, is seen below, and mortals by the name of Milky know. The groundwork is of stars, though which the road lies open to the thunderer's abode. The god of greater nations dwell around, and on the right and left, the palace bound, the commons where they can, the nobler sort with winding doors wide open front the court. This place as far as earth with heaven may vie, I dare to say the louvre of the sky, and when all were placed in seats distinctly known, and he their father had assumed the throne, upon his ivory scepter first he leant, then shook his head that shook the firmament, Air, earth, and seas obeyed almighty nod, and with a general fear confessed the god, at length with indignation, thus he broke his awful silence, and the powers bespoke. I was not more concerned in that debate of empire when our universal state was put to hazard, and the giant race our captive skies were ready to embrace, for though the foe was fierce, the seeds of all rebellion sprung from one original. Now, wheresoever ambient waters glide, all are corrupt and all must be destroyed. Let me this holy protestation make by hell and hell's inviolable lake. I tried whatever in the Godhead lay, but gangrened members must be lopped away before the noble parts are tainted to decay. There dwells below a race of demigods, of nymphs in waters, of fauns in woods, who, though not worthy yet in heaven to live, let them at least enjoy that earth we give. Can these be brought securely lodged below, when I myself, who no superior know, I, who have heaven and earth at my command, have been tempted by Lycon's hand? At this a murmur through the synod went, and with one voice they vote his punishment. Thus, when conspiring traitors dared to loom the fall of Caesar and in him of Rome, the nations trembled with a pious fear, all anxious for their earthly thunderer. Nor was their care, O Caesar, less esteemed by thee than that of heaven, for Jove was deemed, who with his hand and voice did first restrain their murmurs, then resumed his speech again. The gods' silence were composed and sate with reverence due to his superior state. 
Cancel your pious cares, already he has paid his debt to justice, and to me. Yet what his crimes and what my judgments were remains for me thus briefly to declare. The clamours of this vile, degenerate age, the cries of orphans, the oppressor's rage, had reached the stars. I will descend, said I, in hope to prove this loud complaint a lie. Disguised in human shape, I travelled round the world, and more than what I heard I found. O'er Menelaus I took my steepy way by caverns infamous for beasts of prey, then crossed Silene, and the piney shade more infamous by a cursed Laocon made. Dark night had covered heaven and earth. Bef I entered his unhospitable door. Just at my entrance I displayed the sign that somewhat was approaching of divine. The prostrate people pray. The tyrant grins, and adding profanation to his sins, I'll try, said he. And if a god appear, to prove his deity shall cost him dear. T'was late, the graceless wretch my death prepares, when I should soundly sleep oppressed with cares. This dire experiment he chose to prove if I were mortal or undoubted Jove. But first he had resolved to taste my power, not long before, but in a luckless hour. Some legates, sent from Molossian state, were on a peaceful errand come to treat. Of these he murders one, he boils the flesh, and lays the mangled morsels in a dish. Some part he roasts, then serves it up so dressed, and bids me welcome to this humane feast. Moved with disdain, the table I overturned, and with avenging flames the palace burned, the tyrant in a fright, for shelter gains the neighboring fields and scours along the plains. Howling he fled, and fain he would have spoke, but humane voice his brutal tongue forsook. About his lips the gathered foam he churns, and breathing slaughter still with rage he burns. But on the bleeding flock his fury turns. His mantle, now his hide, with rugged hairs, cleaves to his back, a famished face he bears. His arms descend, his shoulders sink away, to multiply his legs for chase of prey. He grows a wolf, his hoariness remains, and the same rage in other members reigns. His eyes still sparkle in a narrower space. His jaws retain the grin and violence of his face. This was a single ruin, but not one deserves so just a punishment alone. Mankind's a monster, and the ungodly times confederate into guilt are sworn to crimes. All are alike involved in ill, and all must by the same relentless fury fall. Thus ended he the greater God's ascent by clamors urgent his severe intent. The less fill up the cry for punishment, yet still, with pity, they remember man, and mourn as much as heavenly spirits can. They ask when those were lost of humane birth. What would he do with all this waste of earth? If his dispeopled world he would resign to beast, a mute, and more ignoble line, neglected altars must no longer smoke, if none were left to worship and invoke, to whom the father of the gods replied, lay that unnecessary fear aside. Mine be the care, new people to provide. I will from wondrous principles ordain a race unlike the first, and try my skill again. Already he had tossed the flaming bran and rolled the thunder in his spacious hand, preparing to discharge on seas and land, but stopped for fear thus violently driven the spark should catch his axle tree of heaven. Remembering in the fates a time when fire should be to the battlements of heaven aspire, and all his blazing worlds above should burn, and all the inferior globe to cinders turn, his dire artillery thus dismissed, he bent his thoughts to some secure punishment, concludes to pour a watery deluge down, and what he durst not burn resolves to drown. The northern breath that freezes floods he binds, with all the race of cloud-dispelling winds, the south he loose to night and horror brings, and fogs are shaken from his flaggy wings. From his divided beard two streams he pours, his head and roomy eyes distill in showers. With rain his robe and heavy mantle flow, and lazy mists are low ring on his brow. Still, 
As he swept along with his clenched fist, he squeezed the clouds, the imprisoned clouds resist. The skies from pole to pole with peals resound, and showers enlarged come pouring on the ground. Then, clad in colors of a various dye, Junonian iris breeds a new supply. To feed the clouds, impetuous rain descends. The bearded corn beneath the burden bends. Defrauded clowns deplore their perished grain, and the long labors of the year are vain. Nor from his patrimonial heaven alone is Jove content to pour his vengeance down. Aid from his brother of the seas he craves to help him with auxiliary waves. The watery tyrant calls his brooks and floods, who rowl from mossy caves their moist abodes, and with perpetual urns his palace fill, to whom in brief he thus imparts his will. Small exhortation needs your powers employ, and this bad world so Jove requires destroy. Let loose the reins to all your watery store, bear down the dams, and open every door. The floods by nature enemies to land, and proudly swelling with their new command, remove the living stones that stop their way, and gushing from their sauce augment the sea. Then, with his mace, their monarch struck the ground. With inward trembling earth received the wound, and rising streams a ready passage found. The expanded waters gathered on the plain. They float the fields and o'ertop the grain. Then... Brushing onwards with a sweepy sway, bare flocks and folds and laboring hinds away, nor safe their dwellings were, for sapped with floods their houses fell upon their household gods. The solid piles, too strongly built to fall, high over their heads behold a watery wall, now seas and earth were in confusion lost. A world of waters, and without a coast. One climbs a cliff, one in his boat is born, and plows over where late he sowed his corn. Others over chimney tops and turrets row, and drop their anchors on the meads below. Or downward driven they bruise the tender vine, or toast aloft and knocked against a pine. And where of late the kids had cropped the grass, the monsters of the deep now take their place. Insulting nereids on the city's ride, and wandering dolphins over the palace glide, on leaves and masts of mighty oaks they brose, and their broad fins entangled in the bows. The frighted wolf now swims amongst the sheep, the yellow lion wanders in the deep, his rapid force no longer helps the boar. The stag swims faster than he ran before, the fowls long beating on their wings in vain, despair of land, and drop into the main. Now hills and vales, no more distinction known, and leveled nature lies oppressed below. The most of mortals perish in the flood, the small remainder dies for want of food. A mountain of stupendous height there stands, betwixt the Athenian and Boeotian lands, the bound of fruitful fields where fields they were, but then a field of waters did appear. Parnassus is its name, whose forky rise mounts through the clouds and mates the lofty skies, high on the summit of this dubious cliff. Deucalion wafting moored his little skiff. He and his wife were only left behind of perished men. They too were humankind. The mountain nymphs and Themis they adore, and from her oracles relief implore. The most upright of mortal men was he, the most sincere and holy woman she. When Jupiter, serving earth from high, beheld it in a lake of water lie, there were so many millions lately lived, but two, the best of either sex, survived. He loosed the northern wind, fierce boreas flies to puff away the clouds and purge the skies. Serenely, while he blows the vapors driven, discover heaven to earth and earth to heaven. The billows fall while Neptune lays his mace on the rough sea and smooths its furrowed face. Already Triton at his call appears above the waves. A Tyrian robe he wears and in his hand a crooked trumpet bears. The sovereign bids him peaceful sounds inspire, and gives the waves the signal to retire. His rhythm shell he takes, whose narrow vent grows by degrees into a large extent, then gives it breath. The blasting with doubling sound runs the wide circuit of the world around. 
The sun first heard it in his early east and met the rattling echoes in the west. The waters, listening to the trumpet's roar, obey the summons and forsake the shore. A thin circumference of land appears and earth, but not at once her visage rears and peeps upon the seas from upper grounds, the streams but just contained within their bounds. By slow degrees into their channels crawl, and earth increases as the waters fall. In longer time the tops of trees appear, which mud on their dishonored branches bear. At length the world is all restored to view, but desolate and of a sickly hue. Nature beheld herself and stood aghast, a dismal desert and a silent waste, which when Decalion with a piteous look beheld he wept, and thus to Pyrrha spoke, O wife, O sister, O of all kind, thy kind, the best, an only creature left behind by kindred love, and now by dangers joined of multitudes who breathe the common air. We two remain, a species in a pair, the rest of the seas have swallowed, nor have we even of this wretched life a certainty. The clouds are still above, and while I speak, a second deluge over our heads may break. Should I be snatched from thence, and thou remain, without relief, or partner of thy pain, how couldst thou such a wretched life sustain? Should I be left, and thou be lost, the sea that buried her I loved, should bury me, oh, could our father his old arts inspire, and make me heir of his informing fire, that I so might abolished man retrieve, and perished people in new souls might live. But heaven is pleased, nor ought we to complain, that we, the examples of mankind, remain. He said, the careful couple joined their tears, and then invoked the gods with pious prayers. Thus, in devotion, having eased their grief, from sacred oracles they seek relief. And to Cephasus brook their way pursue. The stream was troubled, but the ford they knew with living waters in the fountain bread. They sprinkled first their garments and their head, then took the way which to the temple led. The roofs were all defiled with moss and mire, the desert altars void of solemn fire. Before the gradual prostrate they adored, the pavement kissed, and thus the saint implored. O righteous Themis, if the powers above by prayers are bent to pity and to love, if humane miseries can move their mind, if they can forgive and yet be kind, tell how we may restore by second birth mankind and people desolated earth. Thus, then, the gracious goddess nodding said, Depart, and with your vestments veil your head, and stooping lowly down with loosened zones, throw each behind your backs your mighty mother's bones. Amaze the pair and mute with wonder stand, till Pyrrha first refused the dire command. Forbid it, heaven, said she, that I should tear these holy relics from the sepulchre. They pondered the mysterious words again, for some new sense, and long they sought in vain. At length, Decalion cleared his cloudy brow, and said the dark enigma will allow a meaning, which, if I will understand, from sacrilege will free the God's command. This earth our mighty mother is. The stones in her capacious body are her bones. Thus, we, these we must cast behind with hope and fear. The woman did the new solution here. The man defides in his own augury and doubts the gods, yet both resolve to try. Descending from the mount, they first unbind their vests and veiled, they cast the stones behind. The stones, a miracle to mortal view, but long tradition makes it pass for true, did first the rigor of their kind expel, and suppled into softness as they fell, then swelled and swelling by degrees grew warm, and took the rudiments of human form, in perfect shapes and marble, such are seen, when the rude chisel does the man begin, while yet the roughness of the stone remains, without the rising muscles and the veins, the sappy parts and necks resembling juice were turned to moisture, for the body's use, supplying humors, blood, and nourishment. The rest, too solid to receive a bent, converts to bones. And what was once a vein, its former name and nature did retain. By help of power divine and little space, what the man threw assumed a manly face, and what the wife renewed the female race. 
Hence, we derive our nature, born to bear laborious life and hardened into care. The rest of animals from teeming earth produced in various forms receive their birth. The native moisture in its closed retreat digested the sun's ethereal heat as in a kindly womb began to breathe, then swelled and quickened by the vital seed, and some in less and some in longer space were ripened into form, and took a several face. Thus, when the Nile from fairy and fields is fled and seeks with ebbing tides his ancient bed, the fat manure with heavenly fire is warm, and crusted creatures as in wombs, are formed. These, when they turn the glebe, the peasants find, some rude and yet unfinished in their kind, short of their limbs, a lame imperfect birth, one half alive, and one of lifeless earth. For heat and moisture, when in bodies joined, the temper that results from either kind conception makes, and fighting till they mix their mingled atoms in each other fix. Thus, nature's hand the genial bed prepares with friendly discord and with fruitful wars. From hence the surface of the ground with mud and slime besmeared, the feces of the flood received the rays of heaven, and sucking in the seeds of heat, new creatures did begin. Some were of several sorts produced before, but of new monsters earth created more. Unwillingly, but yet, she brought to light thee, Python too, the wandering world to fright. And the new nations, with so dire a sight, so monstrous was his bulk, so large a space did his vast body and long train embrace. Whom Phoebus basking on a bank espied, ere now the god his arrows had not tried. But on the trembling deer or mountain goat, at this new quarry he prepares to shoot. Though every shaft took place, he spent the store of his full quiver, and t'was long before the expiring serpent wallowed in his gore. Then, to preserve the fame of such a deed, for Python slayed, he, Pythian games, decreed, where noble youths for mastership showed strive, to, quote, to run, and steeds, and chariots drive. The prize was fame, in witness of renown. An oaken garland did the victor crown. The laurel was not yet for triumphs born, but every green alike by Phoebus worn did with promiscuous grace his flowing locks adorn. The Transformation of Daphne into a Laurel The first and fairest of his loves was she whom not blind fortune, but the dire decree of angry Cupid forced him to desire. Daphne her name, and Peneus was her sire. Swelled with the pride the new success attends, he sees the stripling while his bow he bends, and thus insults him. Thou lascivious boy, are arms like these for children to employ? No such achievements are my proper claim. Due to my vigor and unerring aim, resistless are my shafts, and Python late in such a feathered death has found his fate. Take up the torch and lay my weapons by, with that the feeble souls of lovers fry, to whom the son of Venus thus replied, Phoebus, thy shafts are sure on all beside, but mine, a Phoebus, mine, the fame shall be of all thy conquests when I conquer thee. He said, and soaring swiftly winged his flight, but nor stopped but on Parnassus's airy height. Two different shafts he from his quiver draws, one to repel desire, and one to cause. One shaft is pointed with refulgent gold to bribe the love and make the lover bold. One blunt and tipped with lead, whose base allay provokes disdain and drives desire away. The blunted bolt against the nymph he dressed, but with the sharp transfixed Apollo's breast. The enamored deity pursues the chase the scornful damsel shuns his loathed embrace. In hunting beasts of prey her youth employs, and Phoebe rivals in her rural joys. With naked neck she goes and shoulders bare, and with a fillet binds her flowing hair. By many suitors sought she mocks their pains, and still her vowed virginity maintains, impatient of a yoke, the name of a bride she shuns, and hates the joys she never tried. On wilds and woods she fixes her desire, 
nor knows what youth and kindly love inspire. Her father chides her off. Thou owest, says he, a husband to thyself, a son to me. She like a crime abhors the nuptial bed. She glows with blushes, and she hangs her head. Then, casting round his neck her tender arms, soothes him with blandishments and filial charms. Give me, my lord, she said, to live and die a spotless maid without the marriage tie. Tis but a small request, I beg no more than what Diana's father gave before. The good old sire was softened to consent, but said her wish would prove her punishment, for so much youth and so much beauty joined opposed the state which her desires designed. The god of light, aspiring to her bed, hopes what he seeks with flattering fancies fed, and is by his own oracles misled. And, as in empty fields the stubble burns, or nightly travellers, when day returns, their useless torches on dry hedges throw, that catch the flames and kindle all the row. So burns the god, consuming in desire, and feeding in his breast a fruitless fire. How well turned neck he viewed. Her neck was bare, and on her shoulders her dishevelled hair. O oh, word combed, said he, with what a grace would every waving curl become her face. He viewed her eyes like heavenly lamps that shone. He viewed her lips too sweet to view alone, her taper fingers and her panting breast. He praises all he sees, and for the rest believes the beauties yet unseen are best. Swift as the wind the damsel fled away, nor did these alluring speeches stay. Stay, nymph, he cried, I follow not a foe. Thus from the lion trips the trembling doe. Thus from the wolf the frightened lamb removes, and from pursuing falcons fearful doves. Thou shunnest the god, and shunnest the god that loves. Ha! <laughs> Lest some thorn thou pierce thy tender foot, or thou shouldst fall in flying my pursuit, to sharp uneven ways thy steps decline, abate thy speed, and I will bait of mine. Yet think from whom thou dost so rashly fly, nor basely born, no shepherd swain and I. Perhaps thou knowest not my superior state, and from that ignorance proceeds thy hate. Me, Claros, Delphi, Tenedos, obey. These hands, the Paterian scepter sway. The king of gods begot me. What shall be, or is, or ever was in fate, I see. Mine is the invention of the charming lyre. Sweet notes and heavenly numbers I inspire. Sure is my bow, unerring is my dart. But ah, more deadly his who pierced my heart. Medicine is mine. What herbs and simples grow in fields and forests, all their powers I know. And I'm the great physician called below. Alas, that field and forest can afford no remedies to heal their lovesick lord, to cure the pains of love, no plant avails, and his own physic the physician fails. She heard not half, so furiously she flies, and on her ear the imperfect accent dies. Fear gave her wings, and as she fled, the wind increasing spread her flowing hair behind and left her legs and thighs exposed to view, which made the god more eager to pursue. The god was young, and was too hotly bent to lose his time in empty compliment, but led by love and fired with such a sight, impetuously pursued his near delight. And when the impatient greyhound slipped from far, bounds over the glebe to course the fearful hare, she, in her speed does all her safety lay, and he with double speed pursues the prey, overruns her at the seating turn, and licks his chaps in vain, and blows upon the flicks. She scapes, and for the neighboring covert strives, and gaining shelter doubts if yet she lives. If little things with great we may compare, such was the god, and such the flying fair, she urged by fear, her feet did swiftly move, but he more swiftly who was urged by love. He gathers ground upon her in the chase, 
now breathes upon her hair with nearer pace, and just as fastening on the wished embrace, the nymph grew pale and in mortal fright, spent with the labor of so long a flight, and now despairing cast a mournful look upon the streams of her paternal brook. Oh, help, she cried, in this extremest need, if water gods or deities indeed, gape earth and with this unhappy wretch in tomb, or chain my form whence all my sorrows come. Scarce had she finished when her feet she found benumbed with cold and fastened to the ground. A filmy rind about her body grows, her hair to leaves, her arms extend to bows. The nymph is all in a laurel gone. The smoothness of her skin remains alone. Yet Phoebus loves her still, and casting round her bowl, his arms some little warmth he found. The tree still panted in the unfinished part, not wholly vegetative, and heaved her heart. He fixed his lips upon the trembling rind. It swerved aside, and his embrace declined. To whom the god, because thou canst not be, my mistress, I espouse thee for my tree. Be thou the prize of honor and renown, the deathless poet and the poem crown. Thou shalt the Roman festivals adorn, and after poets be by victors worn. Thou shalt returning Caesar's triumph grace, when pomps shall in a long procession pass, wreathed on the posts before his palace wait, and be the sacred guardian of the gate, secure from thunder and unharmed by Jove, unfading as the immortal powers above, and as the locks of Phoebus are unshorn, so shall perpetual green thy bows adorn. The grateful tree was pleased with what he said, and shook the shady honors of her head. The Transformation of Io into a Heifer An ancient forest in Thessalia grows, which Tempe's pleasing valley does enclose. Through this the rapid Peneus takes his course, from Pindus rolling with impetuous force. Mists from the river's mighty fall arise, and deadly damps enclose the cloudy skies. Perpetual fogs are hanging o'er the wood, and sound of waters deaf the neighborhood. Deep in a rocky cave he makes abode, a mansion proper for a mourning god. Here he gives audience, issuing out decrees to rivers, his dependent deities. On this occasion hither they resort to pay their homage, and to make their court, all doubtful whether to congratulate his daughter's honor or lament her fate. Spurky is crowned with poplar, first appears, then old Apodanus came crowned with years. Anipius turbulent, Amphrosos tame, and Aeus, Last with lagging waters came. Then of his kindred brooks a numerous throng condole his loss and bring their urns along. Not one was wanting of the watery train that filled his flood or mingled with the main. But Anekis, who in his cave alone wept not another losses but his own, for his dear Io, whether strayed or dead, to him uncertain, doubtful tears he shed. He sought her through the world, but sought in vain, and nowhere finding her, rather feared her slain. Her just returning from her father's brook, Jove had beheld with a desiring look, and, O oh, fair daughter of the flood, he said, worthy alone of Jove's imperial bed, happy whoever shall those charms possess, the king of gods, nor is thy lover less, invites thee to yon cooler shades, to shun the scorching rays of the meridian sun, nor shalt thou tempt the dangers of the grove, alone without a guide. Thy guide is Jove, no puny power, but he whose high command is unconfined, who rules the seas and land, and tempers thunder in his awful hand. Oh, fly not, for she fled from his embrace, over Lerner's pastures he pursued the chase along the shades of the Lycerian plain. At length the god, who never asks in vain, involved with vapors imitating night, both air and earth, and then suppressed her flight, and mingling force with love enjoyed the full delight. Meantime the jealous Juno from on high surveyed the fruitful fields of Arcady, 
and wondered that the mist should overrun the face of daylight and obscure the sun. No natural cause she found from brooks or bogs or marshy lowlands to produce the fogs. Then round the sky she sought for Jupiter, her faithless husband, but no Jove was there. Suspecting now the worst, or I, she said, am much mistaken, or am much betrayed. With fury she precipitates her flight, dispels the shadows of dissembled night, and to the day restores his native light. The almighty lecher, careful to prevent the consequence foreseeing her descent, transforms his mistress in a trice, and now in Io's place appears a lovely cow, so sleek her skin, so faultless was her make, even Juno did unwillingly pleasure take to see so, ri so fair a rival of her love. And what she was, and whence, inquired of Jove. Of what fair herd, and from what pedigree? The god hath caught was forced upon a lie, and said she sprung from earth. She took the word, and begged the beauteous heifer of her lord. What should he do? T'was equal shame to Jove, or to relinquish to, or betray his love. Yet, to refuse so slight a gift, would be more to increase his consort's jealousy. Thus, fear and love by turns, his heart assailed, and stronger love had sure at length prevailed. But... Some faint hope remained. His jealous queen had not the mistress through the heifer seen. The cautious goddess of her gift possessed, yet harbored anxious thoughts within her breast, as she who knew the falsehood of her Jove and justly feared some new relapse of love, which to prevent and to secure her care, to trust Argus, she commits the fair. The head of Argus, as with stars the skies, was compassed round and wore a and hundred eyes. But two by turns their lids in slumber steep, the rest on duty still their station keep. Nor could the total constellation sleep, thus ever present to his eyes and mind. His charge was still before him, though behind. In fields he suffered her to feed by day, but when the setting sun to night gave way, the captive cow he summoned with a call, and drove her back and tied her to the stall. On leaves of trees and bitter herbs she fed, heaven was her canopy, bare earth her bed, so hardly lodged, and to digest her food she drank from troubled streams, defiled with mud. Her woeful story feigned she would have told with hands upheld, but had no hands to hold. Her head to ungentle keeper bowed. She strove to speak, she spoke not, but she lowed. Affrighted with the noise, she looked around, and seemed inquire the author of the sound. Once on the banks where off she had played, her father's bank she came, and there surveyed her altered visage and her branching head. And starting from herself, she would have fled. Her fellow nymphs, familiar to her eyes, beheld, but knew not her in this disguise. Even Anacus himself was ignorant, and in his daughter did his daughter want. She followed where her fellows went, as she were still a partner of the company. They stroke her neck, the gentle heifer stands, and her neck offers to their stroking hands. Her father gave her grass, the grass she took, and licked his palms, and cast a piteous look, and in the language of her eyes she spoke. She would have told her name and asked relief, but wanting words and tears she tells her grief, which with her foot she makes him understand, and prints the name of Io in the sand. Ah, wretched me, her mournful father cried. She, with a sigh to wretched me, replied. About her milk-white neck his arms he threw, and wept, and then these tender words ensue. And art that she whom I have sought around the world, and have at length so sadly found? So found is worse than lost, with mutual words thou answerest not, no voice thy tongue affords, but sighs are deeply drawn from out thy breast, and speech denied by lowing is expressed. Unknowing I prepared thy bridal bed, with empty hopes of happy issue fed, but now the husband of a herd must be thy mate, and the bellwing sons thy progeny. Oh, were I mortal, death might bring relief. 
And now my godhead but extends my grief, prolongs my woes of which no end I see, and makes me curse my immortality. More had he said, but fearful of her stay, the starry guardian drove his charge away to some fresh pasture. On a hilly height he sate himself, and kept her still in sight. The eyes of Argus transformed into a peacock's train. Now Jove no longer could her sufferings bear, but called in haste his airy messenger, the son of Maia, with severe decree, to kill the keeper and to set her free. And with all his harness soon the god was sped, his flying hat was fastened on his head, wings on his heels were hung, and in his hand he holds the virtue of the snaky wand. The liquid air his moving pinions wound, and in the moment shoot him on the ground. Before he came in sight, the crafty god his wings dismissed, but still retained his rod. That sleep-procuring wad, wise Hermes took, but made it seem to sight a shepherd's hook. With this he did a herd of goats control, which by the way he met and slyly stole. Clad like a country swain, he piped and sung, and playing drove his jolly troop along. With pleasure Argus the musician heeds, but wonders much at those new vocal reeds, and whosoever thou art, my friend, said he, up hither drive thy goats and play by me. This hill has brows for them and shade for thee. The god, who was with ease induced to climb, began to scores to pass away the time, and still betwixt his tuneful pipe he plies, and watched his hour to close the keeper's eyes. With much ado, he partly kept awake, not suffering all his eyes repose to take, and asked the stranger who did reeds invent, and whence began so rare an instrument, the transformation of syrinx into reeds. Then Hermithas, a nymph of late there was, whose heavenly form her fellows did surpass, the pride and joy of fair Arcadia plains, beloved by deities, adored by swains, Syrinx her name, by Sylvan's oft pursued, as oft she did the lustful gods delude. The rural and woodland powers disdained with Cynthia hunted, and her rights maintained. Like Phoebe clad, even Phoebe's self she seemed, so tall, so straight, such well-proportioned limbs, the nicest eye did no distinction know, but that the goddess bore a golden bow. Distinguished thus the sight she cheated to, descending from Lysias, Pan admires the matchless nymph, and burns with new desires. A crown of pine upon his head he wore, and thus began her pity to implore. But ere he thus began, she took her flight so swift, she was already out of sight, nor stayed to hear the courtship of the god, but bent her course to Laden's gentle flood. There, by the river stopped, and tired before, relief from water nymphs her prayers implore. But while the lustful god with speedy pace just thought to strain her in strict embrace, he filled his arms with reeds, new rising on the place, and while he sighs his ill success to find the tender canes were shaken by the wind, and breathed a mournful air unheard before. That much surprising Pan yet pleased him more, admiring this new music. Thou, he said, who canst be the partner of my bed, at least shall be the comfort of my mind. And often, often to my lips be joined. He formed the reeds, proportioned as they are, unequal in their length and waxed with care. They still retain the name of his ungrateful fair. Whilst Hermes piped and sung and told his tale, the keeper's winking eyes began to fail, and drowsy slumber on the lids to creep, till all the watchman was at length asleep. Then soon the god his voice and song suppressed, and with his powerful rod confirmed his rest. Without delay his crooked falchion drew, and at one fatal stroke the keeper slew. Down from the rock fell the dissevered head, opening its eyes in death and falling bled, and marked the passage with a crimson trail. Thus Argus lies in pieces, cold and pale, and all his hundred eyes, with all their light, are closed at once in one perpetual night. These Juno takes, that they no more may fail, and spreads them in her peacock's gaudy tail. 
Impatient to revenge her injured bed, she wreaks her anger on her rival's head. With furies frights her from her native home, and drives her gadding round the world to roam. Nor ceased her madness and her flight before, she touched the limits of the fairy and shore. At length, arriving on the banks of Nile, wearied with length of ways and worn with toil, she laid her down, and leaning on her knees invoked the cause of all her miseries. And casting her languishing regards above for help from heaven and her ungrateful Jove. She sighed, she wept, she lowed. Twas all she could, and with unkindness seemed to tax the god. Last, with an humble prayer, she begged repose, or death at least, to finish all her woes. Joe heard her vows, and with a fluttering look in her behalf, to jealous Juno spoke. He cast his arms around her neck, and said, Dame, rest secure, no more thy nuptial bed this nymph shall violate. By sticks I swear, and every oath that binds the thunderer. The goddess was appeased, and at the word was Eo to her former shape restored. The rugged hair began to fall away, the sweetness of her eyes did only stay. Though not so large, her crooked horns decrease, the wideness of her jaws and nostrils cease, her hoofs to hands return in little space, the five long taper fingers take their place, and nothing of the heifer now is seen besides the native whiteness of the skin. Erected on her feet, she walks again, and to the duty of the four sustained, she tries her tongue, her silence softly breaks and fears her former lowings when she speaks, a goddess now through all the Egyptian state, and served by priests who in white linen wait. Her son was a Aphaphus. At length they believed the son of Jove, and as a god received with sacrifice adored in public prayers, he common temples with his mother shares, equal in years and rival in renown, with Ephaphus, the youthful Phaeton, like honor claims, and boasts his sire the sun, his haughty looks and his assuming air, the son of Isis could no longer bear. Thou takest thy mother's word too far, said he, and has usurped thy boasted pedigree. Go, base pretender to a borrowed name. Thus taxed, he blushed with anger and with shame. But shame repressed his rage. The daunted youth soon seeks his mother and inquires the truth. Mother, said he, this infamy was thrown by a faithless on you, and me, your son. He spoke in public, told it to my face, nor durst I vindicate the dire disgrace. Even I, the bold, the sensible of wrong, restrained by shame, was forced to hold my tongue. To hear an open slander is a curse, but not to find an answer is a worse. If I am heaven begot, assert your son by some sure sign. Make my father known, to right my honor, and redeem your own. He said, and saying, cast his arms about her neck, and begged her to resolve the doubt. It is hard to judge if Clymene were moved, more by his prayer whom she so dearly loved, or more with fury fire to find her name traduced and made the sport of common fame. She stretched her arms to heaven and fixed her eyes on that fair planet that adorns the skies. Now by those beams, said she, whose fo holy fires consume my breast and kindle my desires, by him who sees both and clears our sight, by him the public minister of light, I swear that sun begot thee. If I lie, let him cheerful influence deny. Let him no more this perjure creature see, and shine on all the world but only me. If still you doubt your mother's innocence, his eastern mansion is not far from hence. With little pains you to his leave go, and from himself your parentage may know. With joy the ambitious youth his mother heard, and eager for the journey soon prepared. He longs the world beneath him to survey, to guide the chariot, and to give the day. From a rose burning sands he bends his course, nor less in India feels his father's force, his travelling urging till he came in sight and saw the palace by the purple light.